Hello, everyone. Uh, it's three minutes past our usual starting hour, and uh, we are once again uh, together for the ISN Sister Renal Center India Nigeria pairing uh, monthly renal pathology session. And in this session today, we are joined by Dr. Arvind, who has uh, been a frequent speaker in these sessions. And he is going to talk to us about the pathological changes that we see in the kidneys because of hypertension and because of thrombotic microangiopathy. Hypertension, of course, is one of the commonest causes of uh, chronic kidney disease around the world and is interesting in uh, both your country and my country. Uh, and more recently, we have seen an increasing recognition of thrombotic microangiopathy as a cause of both acute and chronic kidney disease as well. So it's, uh, it's really appropriate that we talk about both of these conditions because they primarily affect the vasculature of the kidneys. Uh, thrombotic microangiopathy presentation is quite diverse and therefore, uh, you know, it will be really interesting for us to understand from Dr. Arvind as to what are the specific diagnostic features, uh, what are the features that allow us to understand more about this condition. Uh, but before I invite uh, Dr. Arvind to make his presentation, uh, can I also invite Professor Ifoma Ulasi to make some initial remarks? Uh, Ifoma, can you hear me? Hello. Yes, please go ahead, Ifoma, please. Oh, um, welcome everyone again to this uh, session of the um, Sistarina program between India and Nigeria. Um, I hope uh, that we'll all gain from this as we have been gaining previously. And of course, as you know, uh, hypertension is uh, very prevalent in our, in our environment and our hypertension is always so severe, often associated with the bad um, side effects and complications. So we would benefit from this. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Seka, for the present for giving us this presentation this morning. Welcome everyone once again. Thank you, Professor Elasi, and over to you, Dr. Arvind. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, good morning, all. So from India. So just make full screen. So my screen is visible, sir? Yes, it is. Please yeah. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Okay, okay. Thank you, sir. So we know that the TMA is I an mean, extraordinarily diverse disease. It can occur in different clinical settings. But the most common uh, the renal manifestation of whatever condition may be is acute kidney injury. So the TMA can be hereditary or it can be acquired due to other causes and it can occur in children and adults. And the onset of disease can be sudden or gradual in, at some times. So it occur either as predominant injury in the kidney or possibly secondary to or in association with other primary glomerular disease like lupus nephritis and IG nephropathy. So whatever may be the cause, but the TMA is unified by the common defining clinical and pathological features. So what is the common, the clinical defining feature of TMA? It includes the microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia and end organ damage. And the, it is characterized on pathology, the vascular damage that is manifested by arteriolar and capillary thrombosis with characteristic abnormalities in the endothelium and vessel wall. So we know that the hemolytic uremic syndrome and thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura are two flagship diseases characterized by pathological finding of TMA. So apart from these two flagship diseases, the TMA can occur in variety of clinical conditions like other glomerular nephritis, accelerated hypertension, malignancies, particularly in APML and other leukemias, and in solid organ transplantation, scleroderma renal crisis, and radiation and stem cell transplant. So the secondary uh, atypical uh, HCS can also seen in infection, uh, autoimmune disorders, drugs, pregnancy, 
help syndrome and others. So if you see this uh, chart, so we can uh, come to know that. So the TMA occurs in variety of clinical conditions. Also, we can classify the TME mechanistically based on underlying pathogenesis. Like, so the TME occurring in the setting of uh, due to one milligram factor uh, proteinase deficiency, like in TTP, or complement mediated TME, so that can be either hereditary or acquired, drug mediated TME, sugar toxin, that is so called classical HUS. Metabolism mediated TMA due to cobalamin deficiency and coagulation mediated TMA. So, we can also categorize the TMA mechanistically based on underlying pathogenesis involved in the formation of the So, the few words about the, the two flagship disease. First, I will start with the TTP, the cytokinic purpura. So, it can be inherited or acquired. It is due to of Adam so when the deficiency, I mean, when the enzymatic activity level is then five to ten percent, so it creates the prothrombotic milieu in human body. So it results in formation of thrombosis, particularly in the capillaries, and that results in further man. So what is the basic function of Adam PS13? So it cleaves one valent factor multi multimers that are secreted from vascular endothelial cells. So when you see of Adam PS, it results in actually large one valent factor multimers in the formation of plated thrombi in small vessels with high shear things. So it can be irritable also due to homozygous or compound heterozygous mutation, RMT. And it is acquired <coughs> conditions caused by the inhibition of RMTS13 protein. So this autoantibody formation can occur in infections, malignancies, autoimmune disorders, pregnancies, and in certain drugs. And coming to the second flagship disease, hemolytic uremic syndrome. So, if it occurs due to sugar toxin producing bacteria, so we can say that is typical or classical hemolytic uremic syndrome. So, it is caused by E. coli with this strain O157H7 or O104H4 strains or Sigella dysentery. So, this cigar toxin can also bind complement factor H and it also results in activation of complement. If it is not due to the cigar toxin, so we can categorize those hemolytic uremic syndrome as atypical. So, it comprises 10% of total cases. It occurs due to inadequate regulation or overactivation of alternate complement pathway. So, one should know that what are the uh, proteins, what are the complement proteins involved in the regulation of alternate complement pathway. So, so we know that there are three pathways, I mean, uh, exist in our human body, the uh, classical pathway, lectin pathway and alternate pathway. And the C3 convertase is main uh, enzyme in the class and the alternate pathway. So there are uh, several factors uh, helps on in regulating this C3 convertase enzymes, including factor H, factor I, and uh, complement factor B. So, okay. So this complemented complement mediated TMA results from uncontrolled activation of alternate pathway of complement. Okay. So this atypical HUS results from uncontrolled activation of alternate pathway of complements. So unlike the other two pathways of complement activation, this alternate pathway is constitutively active as a result of spontaneous hydrolysis of C3 to C3B. Okay. But in the absence of normal regulation, this C3B deposits continuously in the tissue and it causes injury to the normal cells. So, this hereditary complement mediated TMA may result from either a loss of function mutation in the regulatory gene, as I already highlighted. The most common is complement factor H, complement factor I, or CD46, or gain of function mutation in the effector gene, either complement factor B or C3. 
and other genetical abnormalities documented in the literature for the single nucleated polymorphism in complement factor H related proteins CD46, copy number variation in CFH related 1 and 3 genes and fusion genes of complement factor H related region with complement factor H causally non-allelic homologous recombination. Okay, so these are the heredities. The functional deficiency in complement factor H may also result from antibody to the complement. So it results in acquired TMA. So it accounts for nearly 10% of complement mediated TMA. So this is, a, I mean, one mechanistic uh, way of uh, causing TMA in human body. So if you see that, so these are the regulatory proteins involved in uh, involved mainly in alternate. Uh, complement pathway. So the factor H constitutes 15 to 30 percent of atypical HUS uh, followed by membrane cofactor protein. It constitutes 10 to 15 percent factor I, factor B and C3 and anti-factor HB. So the mutation in any of these complement related genes may equal HUS. So whatever, whatever again, uh, whatever may be the cause, okay, whatever may be the cause, the morphological features of, of thrombotic microangiopathy is more or less same. It depends on the severity and duration of disease rather than the type of disease occurring in the patients. And it also depends on the presence of serial changes present in the bar. So if if the the duration is less that is suppose less than two months we will find the active lesion in the glomeruli if the duration is more we will find the chronic lesions okay. so what are the active lesions i mean we can see in the glomeruli in thrombotic microangiopathy we can see the fresh fibrin thrombi itself and endothelial swelling uh, so called endotheliosis and endothelial denudation and fragmented red blood cells in the capillary wall and subendothelial flocculin material more evident on electron microscopy, mesangiolysis and microanalysis. And the in changes are also seen in arterioles. So that tells that the my, microangiopathy can involve glomeruli or arterioles and sometimes it can involves predominantly arterioles. So you will see which are the conditions it, can, it involves predominantly arterioles. So we'll see one by one findings with uh, images here often. So what are the early changes of uh, TMA? So the endothelial swelling, so-called endotheliosis, bloodless glomeruli, mesangiolysis, fragmented orbices, fibrin thrombi, and glomerular capillary tuft collapse in presence of predominant arterial involvement of early changes documented in uh, TMA. So if you see this uh, HNE image, okay, here we can see there are three glomes. Okay, so this is one of our case. I mean, of APML, acute thrombolytic leukemia. Here we can see all the three glomeruli uh, show dilated and distended uh, capillary lumen. So why it is distended? It is distended because of this type of homogeneous eosinophilic material, the so-called fibrin thrombi. It is completely occluding the lumen and it is also uh, uh, present in the arterial wall. So to confirm that, we can perform uh, MSV stain also. On MSV stain, if the fibrin is orange to uh, fusinophilic, so we can say that this fibrin or fresh fibrin. If it is blue, the, those fibrins are cold. And this is just I mean, closer a look of uh, the globe. We can see that distended and dilated capillary uh, loop with this type of homogeneous fibrin material. Okay. okay. So on mass and trichome, it is a little bit fusinophilic. So in this picture, the fibrin thrombi again it is present both in the globular capillary lumen and it is also present in the arteriolar wall. Apart from that, what we can see that there are I mean, extra vested RBCs we can see in the wall because of endothelial injury. Okay. Yeah. So someone, someone want to ask?
No, no, please go ahead. Yeah, okay, okay. So because of endothelial injury, so we can also start seeing the debris and neutrophils in the wall. So if you are seeing this type of debris and neutrophils in the wall, so that is indicating that there is endothelial injury is happened in this case. Okay, so this is another picture is showing the presence of fibrin thrombi both in the uh, glomerular capillary lumen and in the arterial wall with lot of extra vesicated RBCs in the extra vesicated and fragmented RBCs in the arterial wall. But most of the times we will not find, I mean, this much fresh fibrin in the glomerular capillary lumen. We will see very focal uh, fibrin in the capillary lumen and also we can find the extra vested RBCs in the wall. So if you are finding this type of extra vested RBCs and fragmented RBCs in the wall, so that is uh, telling that so the microangiopathy happened in this patient. And in this picture, we can appreciate that there is diffuse endothelial swelling. So the endothelial cells are a little bit swelled up and so at some places it is also occluding the lumen. So these are the clues. So if you are find, if you are not finding fresh fibrin uh, in glomerulus, that is that doesn't mean that so it is not thrombotic microangiopathy. But if you are seeing this type of endotheliosis, fragmented RBCs in the wall, so that that are the indirect clues that the thromb microangiopathy happened in this patient. And this is the another, I mean, uh, microscopic findings. Uh, described in the thrombotic microangiopathy in subacute uh, duration, the so-called bloodless glomeruli. Okay, so if you see that this glom, I mean, I can't able to appreciate the capillary lumen very clearly. So the uh, mesenchyme is completely yeah. with the capillaries, mm -hmm. and you can see there is some foamy appearance. Okay, so if you if you start seeing this type of foamy appearance in the mesenchyme, so that is subacute, I mean, nearly around one to two month duration of thrombotic microangiopathy. So this bloodless glomeruli is also one finding described in the uh, subacute thrombotic microangiopathy. And here what we can see that, so the mesangium is completely lysed, okay? I mean, I can't able to appreciate the mesangium, but the capillary loops again distended and dilated and shows and shows marked congestions with RBCs. So this so-called paralyzed glomeruli is also described in thrombotic microangiopathy. So the bloodless glomeruli, paralyzed glomeruli, are also can be seen in uh, thrombotic microangiopathy. At sometimes it involves only the arterial wall. Okay. The fibrin you will find only in the arterial wall with complete occlusions, near complete occlusions and extra vesicated and fragmented RBCs in the uh, arterial wall. So fibrinoid necrosis and thrombosis of inter, uh, interlobular artery can also be seen in thrombotic microangiopathy. So here we can see that the uh, one of the interlobular arteries expanded and uh, filled with fibrin with entrapped erythrocytes. So uh, what is the characteristic, I mean, uh, observation uh, finding here is, although the fibrin is present uh, in the lumen and in the wall, but there is no inflammation in the wall. If you are finding inflammation in the uh, arterial wall, you should, I mean, uh, exclude vasculitis before considering the possibility of thrombotic microangiopathy. Okay. So these are the changes uh, of thrombotic microangiopathy in uh, yearly to subacute uh, duration. So here after we will see the changes, uh, particularly in the glomerulus, in, in chronic, the late changes of uh, thrombotic microangiopathy. So these late changes include the globular basement membrane duplication and double counters, the mesangial expansion with features of mesangiolysis and variable degree of focal, segmental and global glomerular sclerosis. So in chronic and durations, we will find due to repeated repetitive endothelial injury, we will find the reduplication of uh, reduplication of glomerular basement membrane that is also better evident on PA stems. We can see the two layers of basement membrane with some loosened material in between. Okay, so this double contoured uh, 
capillary wall indicates that this is we are dealing with the chronic uh, thrombotic microangiopathy. And uh, also, I mean, if you see this globe, it somehow mimic like, I mean, MPGN. So we can also find there is endotheliosis and there is some endocapillary hypercellularity uh, uh, nearly occluding the lumina. So, but if the immunofluorescence is negative, so we can uh, say that this MPGN pattern is due to chronic problem. So what I want to say that, so the MPGN pattern can also be appreciated in chronic TMA. So to exclude glomerular disease, so we should look for immunofluorescence. So if IF is negative, then we can think of this finding could be due to chronic TMA. So uh, chronic changes uh, can also be uh, observed in arterioles. So here you can see that uh, arterioles yes, marked endothelial swelling in all these arterioles with near uh, total luminal occlusions and there are some uh, mononuclear inflammatory cells present in the core. And the uh, corresponding gloom is also showing ischemic changes. Okay, we can see this this gloom is not healthy. We can see the marked wrinkling of the capillary wall, and also we can appreciate here the double con contouring appearance. As a result of uh, this um, arterial luminal occlusions, the and also the subsequent glomerular injury, the segmental glomerular sclerosis can also be seen in chronic TMA. Okay. So if you are finding this type of segmental sclerosis along with uh, chronic TMA changes, so we should label uh, this as uh, secondary segmental sclerosis rather than primary. Okay. And the changes, I mean, can also be appreciated in the uh, arterioles and arteries. In the arterioles, we can uh, see that marked intimal thickening with hyaline uh, material deposition, which is causing near total occlusion of the lumina. And the internal artery can also show that a mild to moderate fibro intimal thickening with the mixoid changes in the uh, intimal layer. So these are the some chronic changes evident in medium-sized arteries. And because of repetitive endothelial injury and uh, the formation of new uh, membrane, elastic lamina, so we can also appreciate the onion uh, skinny like appearance. We can see the concentric uh, lamination with associated edema in the intimate layer. So these are the some uh, changes uh, we can see in a chronic uh, vascular TMA. And uh, once the uh, fibrinolysis uh, reaction sets in, the thrombus will start uh, resolve. Okay, as a result of resolution, you will find the recanalization in the uh, artery. So it uh, may give the bull's height appearance, which you see from the low power appearance. Okay? So these are the changes. So one should remember while seeing the renal biopsies. So as a result of uh, glomerular and vascular TMA, the changes are also evident in tubules. So it manifests as acute tubular injury. So that we know that it is characterized with simplified epithelium and with a significant nuclear reactive ATP. And this acute tubular injury, if it is severe, it is accompanied by uh, significant interstitial edema. And the cortical necrosis can also be seen when uh, when the thrombus is occluding the interlobular artery. So obviously, when in the chronic uh, stages, we will expect if the uh, of some degree. So Arvind, Arvind, uh, Arvind uh, whenever you are showing any biopsy, uh, describing any biopsy finding, if you can show it in the in the in the figure, it will be easier to understand for everybody. Arvind. Okay, okay, thanks. Thank you, thank you, Arvind. Okay, sir. Okay, so, so I mean, this, this picture, I mean, depicts the acute tubular injury. We can see that, so these are the proximal tubular epithelial cells and these are the distal tubular epithelial cells. We can see that is simplifications of lining. So what do you mean by simplification of lining? So that, that is loss of brush border, okay? So if you see that is, that is smooth border so that we can say the lining is simplified. In normal condition, the border will not be smooth because of presence of brush border. So here the brush border is lost. So the lining is simplified. 
so here we can say that there is uh, acute tubular injury is present and the surrounding interstitium is also showing the diffuse interstitial edema we can appreciate the paleness no paleness so the paleness indicate that there is presence of interstitial edema so in chronic conditions so it, it results in uh, the tubular atrophy with interstitial fibrosis Okay, so these are the light microscopy findings of uh, thrombotic microangiopathy. Uh, we can see in different compartments. Okay, so any doubts? I mean, if you want or want to ask, you can ask before going to the immunofluorescence finding. Okay. Please go ahead, Arvin. People. Will... Okay. So, and, I mean, uh, people so, feel so free to see the immunofluorescence microscopy. Okay. So obviously, I mean, uh, if you are doing a fibrinogen stain, so the fib if fibrin in the capillary lumen and the arterioles will be highlighted on fibrinogen stain, okay? And there will be some non-specific weak IgM staining with uh, less frequent C3 and Ig can be seen in glomerular and arterioles, okay? So this is uh, fibrinogen stain. So that is highlighting the presence of fibrin in both in the lumen and also in the wall and uh, is present in the one of the arterioles. So it can show some non-specific staining for IgM, but if it shows significant staining for IgG, IgA, so we should consider primary glomerular disease occurring along with the thrombotic microangiopathy. Okay, so one should be aware of that. Coming to the electron microscopy. See, in electron microscopy, so this fibrins are I mean, electron dense okay the fibrins are electron dense like adipocytes so, so this fibrin are also very electron dense so you will find more electron dense fibrin uh, fibrils in the capillary lumen sangium and subendothelium and there will be marked the subendothelial expansion by electron loosened material so that is called fluffiness and endothelial cell swelling is can be appreciated and fragmented orbices in the subendothelium and sangium mesangiolysis and reduplication of glomerular basin. Okay. okay, so these are some photographs depicting the EM changes. Here we can see that, so this is an endothelial cell, okay. So endothelial cells are detached from the glomerular uh, basement membrane. You can start seeing these pieces also. And there is some, the electron lucent material is also present here in the subendothelium. So that is indicating that, so the endothelial injury is happened in this patient. And the fibrin, as I told, it is very electron dense. So you will find the electron dense uh, fibril material in the lumen. And if it is in the along the wall, you can also find along the capillary wall. So the arterial lumen also, uh, we can see that there is electron dense material, cellular debris and uh, fragmented orbices. So this is the another picture is showing the detachment of endothelial cells from the basement membrane. And there is a double contoured appearance of the basement membrane. So that, that tells that, so that it is chronic uh, thrombotic microangiopathy. Okay. So these are the, I mean, although the electron microscopy and immunofluorescence findings are not specific, so one should uh, then to rule out the other, I mean, causes of uh, thrombotic microangiopathy. So coming to the scleroderma, <laughs> the scleroderma is an, we know that it is an autoimmune disease of unknown etiology. So that can cause inflammation and fibrosis of various organs. So the roughly or broadly, we can classify the scleroderma into diffuse or limited cutaneous involvement. In either of these conditions, the scleroderma renal crisis can occur in 5 to 10% of the cases. And it is always associated with severe hypertension and renal failure. So the pathological findings are essentially identical to other causes of thrombotic microangiopathy. But if the thrombosis preferentially involves arteries and arterioles over the glomerular capillaries, okay. So this is one condition. So we'll find the microangiopathy, the thrombotic microangiopathy changes more in arteries and arterioles rather than in glomerular capillaries, okay. But in case of the flagship disease like hemolytic uremic syndrome, TTP, you will find more PMA changes in glomerular capillaries rather than arterioles. 
So uh, coming to the accelerated hypertension. So the previously it was called as malignant hypertension, but now this term is absolute. But somehow, I mean, in some literatures, it is still remains that. So what is accelerated hypertension? It is defined as severe elevation of arterial pressure that is more than 200 by 120 mHg in combination with fundoscopic changes, including retinal hemorrhages and exudates with or without papillary edema. It is often accompanied by tor uh, torquid organ damage. So the hematuria can be seen in 21% of the uh, cases and proteinuria is also documented in 63.4% cases of accelerated hypertension. So if the accelerated hypertension uh, occurs suddenly, I mean occurs de novo, without uh, the long-standing chronic hypertension, so you will find the changes very characteristic of TME, what I described uh, previously. I mean, compare, I mean, like scleroderma renal crisis, you will find changes more in arterioles and arteries rather than uh, glomeruli. Okay. So here we can see that uh, one of the arterioles are showing marked mixoid changes in the intimal layer, which the neutrophils and leukocytes infiltrating the wall. And also you can find the fibrin uh, thrombic completely occluding the uh, lumina. But sometimes the fibrin is very focal. Uh, you will find only along the wall. Okay. If uh, the accelerated hypertension occurs in uh, the setting of chronic long-standing hypertension, you will also find uh, the, the reduplication of internal elastic lamina. So if you are finding this type of reduplication, multiple layering of internal elastic lamina, so that indicates that uh, the changes are chronic and the accelerated hypertension develops in the setting of uh, long-standing hypertension. And in addition to the, the reduplication, you will also find the marked intimal thickening and medial hypertrophy in long-standing hypertension. Okay. So I just covered the hypertension changes along with this. So these are the changes of uh, the long-standing hypertension in the renal biopsy. So this is also called hyperplastic arteriosclerosis. Okay. Hyperplastic arteriosclerosis, you will find the multiple layering of internal elastic lamina, multiple layering of internal elastic lamina. So this is, I mean, EVG stain, okay? The EVG stain will highlight the elastic lamina as black colors. So we can see there are multiple layering and also there are fragmentation of the internal elastic lamina. And there is uh, concentric intimal thickening and medial hypertrophy. So, hyperplastic arteriosclerosis, one form of uh, renal manifestation, and hyaline arteriosclerosis, the another uh, manifestation of long-standing hypertension. So that can that can be seen in this picture. We can see that homogeneous eosinophilic hyaline material present uh, concentrically in the intimal layer of uh, or tutors and nearly one small size increase. And uh, normally, normally in the arterioles, so there are only the two layers of tunica media is present. Okay, the two layers is acceptable in normal patients. But in case of long standing hypertension, you will find uh, more than two layers. So here we can see there are three to four layers. So that is indicating there is medial uh, hypertrophy. Okay? So hyperplastic arteriosclerosis, hyaline arteriolar sclerosis, and medial hypertrophy are the findings we can see in long-standing hypertension. The consequence to the uh, changes in the arterioles and arteries, the corresponding glow also shows ischemic changes. Here we can find that ischemic uh, collapse, I can say that the ischemic wrinkling of glomerular capillary wall with some dilated Bowman spaces. As the ischemia progresses and persists, the corresponding glomerular tuft strands and retracts to the vascular pole with filling of Bowman space by the collagen. So this is one form of uh, global glomerular sclerosis occurring due to ischemia in hypertension. And the segmental and global solidification of glomerulus also 
can be seen in uh, long standing hypertension due to changes in the arterioles and arteries. Okay. So, so these are the I mean, uh, broad morphological changes of thrombotic microangiopathy and uh, hypertension. Okay. So, apart from this uh, two flagship disease, the TMA can also occur uh, due to metabolic derangement, that is, due to homozygous mutation in methyl malonic aciduria and homocysteinuria type C protein. So this is I mean, less common. In this metabolic some mediated TMA usually occurs in children, it is less than one year of age. And it is also reported in uh, occasionally in young adults with hypertension and acute kidney injury. And there are uh, causes of uh, coagulation mediated TMA that occurs due to homozygous mutation in diacyl glycerol kinase epsilon G. So in this condition, the initial presentation is also typically in children less than one year of age with DGKE mutation. The clinical feature of disorders associated with other mutations have not been described yet. If you see here, so the management of thrombotic microangiopathy is different in, uh, in conditions due to different mechanistic causes. Okay. So the plasma infusions and plasma exchange are uh, recommended in TMA due to adam ts 13 deficiency or complement mediated TMA. But in case of metabolism mediated TMA, the supplements like vitamin B12, folinic acids, beta can be administered. And the uh, anti complement agents like eclusimab, uh, also uh, approved by FDA in cases of complement mediated TMA. So, I mean, apart from this. Uh, Causes the drugs can also cause uh, thrombotic microangiopathy either because of immune reaction or toxic dose related reaction. So, there are more than 50 uh, drugs uh, documented in the literature that can cause thrombotic microangiopathy. So, the uh, most common and uh, frequently used drugs, I mean, I can highlight that the queening, the anti malarial drug uh, can cause uh, drug. Uh, mediated TMA due to immune reactions. Other drugs, particularly the chemotherapeutic agents, uh, well documented in the literature are cyclophosphamides, doxorubicin, dinorubicin, gemstabine, mitomycin C, cisplatin, docetaxel, bleomycin, and vincristines. So you should know the complete clinical and uh, details and the laboratory parameters details so before coming uh, and uh, before coming to the conclusion of the etiology of thrombotic microangiopathy in the patient so uh, so kidney biopsy remains the gold standard for diagnosing renal thrombotic microangiopathy so it excludes other potential causes of kidney injury but to find the uh, etiology of TMA, so we need the additional investigation and cl complete clinical data for the subsequent therapeutic management. So this is the broad I mean, flowchart how to approach TMA once uh, we find in the renal biopsy or I mean uh, once di uh, diagnosed after clinical findings. So first thing what we should rule out if you are finding TMA in the renal biopsy, the TTP has to be excluded. Okay, So that can be done by measuring ADAMTS-13 activity levels. So if it is the level is less than 30%, so we can say that so this TMA uh, can be due to uh, TTP. So we can uh, give treatment for that. If not, we should start work up for hemolytic genomic syndrome. So before going for the atypical HUS, we should exclude the classical HUS caused by Shigella toxin uh, hemolytic hemic syndrome by doing stool or swab pulses or by serology. And further, I mean, we can see here these are many uh, causes of TME. We should go step by step uh, to exclude one by one. And extensive complement workups, including serum C3, C4 levels, and factor H, factor I levels, and uh, factor H antibody levels are required to uh, document 
that the simulative iremic syndrome is due to complement dysregulation. So I'm not going into the deep. Okay. So there's, I mean, these are the few investigations recommended in patients uh, identified as having a typical hemolytic uremic syndrome. Okay. So as I already highlighted that uh, the stool and rectal swab culture for uh, stick uh, cause of hemolytic uremic syndrome. And to, for the disorders of complement regulations, the various factors like CT, C4 levels and factors H and I levels and membrane cofactor protein expression levels by flow cytometry. And finally, the gene mutation analysis for these factors can be done for the confirmation. Okay. So, okay. So, uh, the TMA can also occur uh, concurrently in, with other glomerular diseases like anti GBM disease, positive human glomerular nephritis, post infectious glomerular nephritis, membrane proliferative glomerular nephritis, IG nephropathy, and membrane nephropathy. So when both glomerular disease and TMA are present, so there is a possibility that these two unrelated disease may be coincidentally injuring the kidney simultaneously. So the disease progression may be bad in those cases. So coming to the TMA in renal allografts, so thrombotic microangiopathy can also be seen in allograft biopsy. If you are finding thrombotic microangiopathy in uh, allograft biopsy, you should think, so what are the causes that uh, can be? If you are finding TMA in the yearly biopsies, like implantation biopsies, so it might come from the decreased donor also. Uh, most commonly, if the donor is decreased due to head injury. And it can also occur as a result of ischemia reperfusion injury that happened uh, during organ procurement. And we know that the TMA can uh, be the manifestation of antibody-mediated re rejection. In those cases, the C4D definitely will help. If C4D is positive, it's okay. So this is a, this TMA is because of antibody-mediated rejection. And the TME can also be due to the calcium inhibitor toxicity. So in those cases, we have to look for the presence of um, isometric vacuoles in the uh, the presence of isometric vacuoles in the proximal tubular epithelial cells or the fluid. So okay, this TME may, might be due to CNA toxicity. So in those cases, we have to ask the clinicians uh, for the serum TAC levels. If serum TAC levels are also high. And if C4 is also negative, so we can uh, come to the conclusion that this TMA is due to CNA toxicity rather than other conditions. And one should uh, also aware that the TMA can recur, recur, recur in the allograft biopsy, particularly in cases of atypical hemolytic uremic syndromes. So these are the few recurrence rate of TMA documented in atypical HUS, that is complete mediated thrombotic microangiopathy. The recurrence rate is more in uh, factor H uh, related, T, uh, factor H mutated TME, around 80% and factor I uh, related TME. If you see that the membrane cofactor protein, so that is membrane bound regulator protein. So in this case also, uh, the recurrence is present, but the recurrence is very 20%. Okay? And the recurrence in other uh, genetic mutations are not known in the literature. Okay, so with this, I'll come to my conclusion slides. So any um, doubt in the morphology of thrombotic microangiopathy, I will leave with these slides in the basic morphology slide. So we'll discuss it later. Any doubt, sir? Anything to add? It's a clinical perspective. Hi. Yeah, oh, very informative. Thank you so much, uh, Arvind. And other thing is, uh, uh, sometimes when we do not do a biopsy because of the thrombocytopenia, if there is evidence of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia in the form of decrease in the hemoglobin, presence of fragmented cells or what we call a schistozoid in the peripheral smear examination, increased LDH, low haptoglobin. Even at that time, we approach the HUS the way you have described, you know, doing a stool test and then doing genetic testing and looking for, uh, you know, TTP, uh, uh, Adam TS levels, the serum and their activities. So that's how it is. 
ओके सर वेरी इंफॉर्मेटिव अरविंद एक्सेलेंट थैंक यू सर थैंक यू वेरी मच थैंक्स अरविंद एनी एनी कमेंट्स और क्वेश्चंस फ्रॉम एनीवन प्लीज फील फ्री टू sort of enter enter your question in the chat box or you can raise your hand and i we will unmute you i can only second what dr ramachandran just said that this was a, a an excellent talk by dr arvind he covered almost everything related to the diagnosis of thrombotic microangiopathy specifically hemolytic uremic syndrome because it is becoming an increasing clinical problem uh, 20 years ago we recognized hus much less than we are doing today we have also become conscious of the various ways in which hemolytic uremic syndrome can present and and the, the diversity of clinical situations where we need to be conscious of the presence of uh, thrombotic microangiopathy uh, i see a hand raised by dr uh, adefi dipe so please go ahead dr adefi dipe uh, thank you so much uh, dr harafin for this wonderful lecture on the thrombotic microangiopathy um like um, dr rajas rightly said that um, tma has now become um, an increasingly disturbing pathology particularly for our, our renal patients and then um, sometimes being able to tease out some of the factors that are responsible for this entity goes a long way in uh, further management of the patients and uh, for the pathologist sometimes it can also be very difficult uh, i remember dr arafin uh, telling us that um, sometimes even looking at the biopsies uh, may be kind of difficult telling what exactly is the underlying factor in tma uh even grossly if you look at the the kidneys uh uh that are features of tma many of them have these uh, petechial hemorrhages on the cortical surface which can be seen in many pathologies for instance malignant hypertension you can see petechial hemorrhages hus you can also see uh, petechial hemorrhage even sclerodema so you 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 sometimes you are, you are caught uh, in a way in which case you actually don't know uh whether you are dealing with the head or a tail but uh, an in-depth analysis of the biopsy materials we give uh, that we get uh, can help us in narrowing down the diagnosis and many of the things that uh, dr arafin uh, has actually mentioned can be uh, extremely helpful but the aspect i really want to uh, draw our attention to is the um uh, incidence of tma among the renal transplant patients Uh, which sometimes can be very difficult to manage because you actually need to know what is the underlying factor. Are you dealing with um, an, uh, uh, an antibody-mediated rejection? Are you dealing with effect of uh, excessive use of uh, cyclosporine? Or are you dealing with a recurrent disease? Or you're dealing with an atypical uh, HUS, which uh, may be recurring in the patient? So I think uh, as pathologists and uh, clinicians alike, uh being able to synchronize information and helping this patient will go a long way in um, increasing the standard of our practice thank you so much dr arafin for the lecture thank you dr adefi bide i don't think there was a question there uh, we also have dr ifoma ulasi yeah thank you very much uh, vivek and thank you very much arafin for very extensive lecture on this uh, topic um i think uh, basically maybe the problem we have here in nigeria is that most of us don't biopsy our patients we all, uh, most of the times our biopsies are based on uh, in our researches so um i'm sure many of us are not making the diagnosis as we should um so why i'm saying this is that maybe between us and you we can develop a way of seeing that we increase biopsies and um, so that uh, a lot of this uh, histological diagnosis can be made but anyway talking on that going back to some of the biopsies we did along our researches i'm not sure we encountered a lot of H, um, hus probably because it was that targeted to i mean certain diseases 
So um, I'm hoping that something can come out of this so that we can do a lot more between the two um, countries and two centers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Lassi. I, I also had a question come to me over email from Dr. Sandeep Pemira. And uh, Arvind, he wants to know how to differentiate anchor vasculitis and uh, fibrinoid necrosis due to thrombotic microangiopathy that involves only arterioles. Yeah, so I mentioned in this picture, yeah. Okay, yeah, the TMA can also involve the interlobular artery, okay. But if you see that this interlobular artery is lacking the inflammation in the arterial wall, okay. If you're finding inflammation in the wall, so that is indicating that so we are dealing with vasculitis. It could be anchor related also. But if you're not finding, but in case of TMA related fibrinoid necrosis, you will not find any significant inflammation in the uh, wall. So that gives the clue that, I mean, if you're, that gives the clue, if you're finding inflammation, you should think in the line of uh, ANCA mediated vasculitis. All right. Thank you. Uh, there is also a question from Dr. Sahil Bagai in the chat box, uh, who wants to know how much time it would take for accelerated hypertension to cause pathological changes. Yeah. I think that's a very difficult question to answer, right? Because uh, we uh, we don't know, uh, at least in clinical situation, when the hypertension started, if a patient generally would come to a hospital with the end result of whatever uh, has been the uh, has been the pathology, uh, this kind of question can only be answered in an experimental situation where you can time this. Experiment. But uh, but in any case, do you do you have an answer to this question, either you or Dr. Ramachandran? Or anyone else? Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, the data from uh, renal transplantation, because there they do uh, the uh, the clinical, uh, the kidney biopsies often in patients with gram dysfunction and high blood pressure. What they say, acute features of uh, uh, TMA or hemolytic eremic syndrome can be seen very early in patients with uh, malignant hypertension, the form of microangiopathy or you know, thrombosis. But in native kidneys, I'm not aware of the details. Yeah, yeah, that's very helpful. Thanks, uh, Dr. Ramachandran. Arvind, anything you would like to add to that? So, I mean, if I'm not wrong, I mean, so not all patients with axillary hypertension develops thrombotic microangiopathy. So that, of course, is true, but I think the question was, if it has to develop, how soon does it develop after development of that time? I mean, it is not, I mean, Myocardial infection, we know that, I mean, this much time uh, changes, but it is not documented well in. Yeah, yeah, understood. Dr. Adefepida, your hand is still up. Do you have any, any other uh, point to make or a question? Not really, not really, thank you. I, I'll, I'll, I'll put it down, thanks. No worries, no worries. That's, I, I just wanted to make sure that I'm not missing anything. All right, any other question from anyone? I guess this is very important and this is uh, quite timely, this lecture, because as has been pointed out by uh, Dr. Ramachandran and also by Dr. Arvind, uh, and if you follow the literature, you will see that the number of publications around on this topic are increasing, uh, increasing exponentially and uh, the importance of uh, vascular lesion, specifically uh, thrombotic microangiopathy is increasing in various other disease conditions let's say in IgA nephropathy or uh, you know, other um, immune mediated glomerular diseases, in addition to the direct immunological injury, injury to the vasculature, which leads to thrombotic microangiopathy also con contributes substantially. And we can do a lot to intervene there and uh, address not only the basic insult, but also the insult uh, to the vasculature and to thrombotic microangiopathy. I think Dr. Arvind is uh, scrolling through his slides, so maybe he wants to make a point. Did you have a point, Arvind? You are muted. So just I kept it is a classical image of thrombotic microangiopathy with fresh fibrillin. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. I see no other question, in which case we are coming uh, to the end of our allocated hour. And I hope uh, uh, 
you will all agree that this has been a very enriching presentation and uh, also the discussion that has followed for which we must thank Dr. Arvind uh, for taking out his time, putting together this presentation and, and sharing all his knowledge with us. Uh, I would also like to thank all of you. And as I, uh, the information that I put in, in the chat and that uh, these lectures are all recorded and the recordings will be made available on the YouTube uh, YouTube channel, uh, the address of which has been given in the chat box. So please head over to that YouTube channel where you can find the previous recordings also and uh, uh, do share this information with your colleagues who have not been able to join today uh, so that they can also benefit from the knowledge that has been shared by Dr. Arvind and Dr. Ritambra and, and many other colleagues. Uh, you should subscribe to that channel. That way you will get automatic information and um, alert notification about any updates that might appear in that channel, uh, which will allow you to not miss any new content. So all that remains for me is to thank all of you also, and we will meet again in a month's time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone.